deadly explosion was caused by a person. Today we learned why it won't be considered a crime. Denver's mayor quietly gave the old sheriff a new gig with a $160,000 taxpayer-funded paycheck. A prayer for peace and for people to be unafraid to return to the mosque that was threatened this week. Protecting against the dangers in Colorado's private water supply. The women behind the state flag we love. And your good news brings us home this Friday on Next. Not everything terrible that happens is someone's fault. Not everything terrible that is someone's fault turns out to be a crime. And that is what prosecutors say happened with the explosion at Heather Gardens, the blast that killed a woman at that retirement community in Aurora last year. 82-year-old Carol Ross, a woman who taught knitting and crocheting. Marshall Zellinger explains why what happened to her is not a crime. I hope it's not somebody's house. The gas explosion at Heather Gardens one year ago tomorrow happened at 529 p.m. Here come the sirens. 85 minutes after the first report of a gas leak. Nine News just received hundreds of pages of investigative documents detailing what happened and why. The summary is on page 31 of this 243-page police report. This explosion and subsequent fire was caused by unintentional human act or omission, human error. Here's what happened. A contractor was installing cable lines this time last year, using a machine to dig into the ground. When they dug, they hit a gas line. 811 has a slogan, know what's below, call before you dig. One of the investigators noted in their report, in fact, there were no locates for utilities done for the address. That means 811 was not called before the digging. Even though 811 was not called, the district attorney's office determined the case will not be filed for criminal charges at this time based on insufficient evidence for the likelihood of conviction beyond a reasonable doubt at trial. I'm not sure that you can say that there wasn't any kind of negligence here. The question is, does it rise to the level of criminal negligence and who is ultimately responsible? Um, there are after action items here that I think uh, the city and the fire department need to take a strong look at with these companies involved with this, but to say that there's criminal liability is a different step altogether. You know, I did a lot of extensive reporting on 811 and what's underground following this explosion, and I learned a lot about the coloring of the flags and what's on the ground. And Kyle, in this investigative report, it talks about the contractors knowing that Heather Gardens marked the ground yellow or white paint and yellow flags were to indicate sprinkler lines. Okay. But from my reporting with 811, yellow flags indicate buried gas lines. And that is not, that discrepancy is not referenced in the report. Just the worker says yellow flags were sprinkler lines. Yeah. Well, my work with 811 says yellow flags are gas lines. And that's not referenced in the report. Holy cow. All right. Thank you, Marshall. Appreciate it. Colorado's capital does not just shut down when the legislature is out of session. Through the summer, lawmakers work ahead to try and set up future bills, try to find consensus on some things. Today, some of those bills went through their final test, like the bill to reduce the prison population by putting some 18 to 25 year olds through juvenile court instead of adult court. The idea would be to reduce sentences for felonies like sex assault and robbery. The committee decided they're going to pump the brakes on that idea. They are moving forward with proposed school safety bills, like giving students excused days off for mental health and better funding behavioral health training for educators. Ever wonder what Denver's old sheriff is up to since he resigned? No, of course you don't. Why would you wonder about that? But he's still drawing a city paycheck because the day after Patrick Furman was moved out of the sheriff's job, he was quietly slid into a new $160,000 a year role with Mayor Hancock's administration. The city of Denver has a new workplace safety plan. It ensures that an employee who slips up and experiences a fall from grace has a cushy place to land. Sheriff Patrick Furman resigned amid criticism for failed jail reforms on October 14th. On October 15th, Furman quietly started a new role with the city, appointed by the mayor to work on technology initiatives. His annual salary went from $194,000 as sheriff to $160,000 as whatever it is they say he's doing now. The mayor's office had been silent about this move until it was first reported by Denverite. Now they say Furman is building on his work around innovation and utilization of complex data to measure reforms. Speaking of reforms, Mayor Hancock is now facing a less compliant city council, one that is quite interested in reforming the city policies that give the mayor almost absolute power. You can decide for yourself whether you think that's a good idea. 
but in quietly shuffling the former sheriff into his cushy new gig, Mayor Hancock is basically making his opponent's case for them. Denver police say that the man arrested for threatening behavior at a mosque yesterday actually had an airsoft gun. Police say that Benjamin Casillas Rocha claimed to have left his phone inside the downtown Denver Islamic Center at 30th and Downing. Surveillance video shows us what happened outside the place. Police say that Casillas Rocha went to the mosque high on drugs, yelling at people there. Police say he left, came back a few minutes later, waving what appeared to everybody like a rifle, turned out to be an air gun. He was arrested nearby. We have seen threats like that against a house of worship galvanize a community. I mean, think of the packed turnout for the services at the synagogue in Pueblo after it was threatened by a white supremacist. But in this case, it appears that people were dissuaded from attending the most popular service of the week at that mosque. Our Sonia Gutierrez was there. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. On a day when this downtown Denver mosque is normally packed, Allahu Akbar. There were fewer people worshiping. Because maybe some people are still afraid or watching media and don't know exactly what's going on. But today was about making it clear. My brothers and sisters, my topic today is about the value of safety. Safety is one of the most significant feelings any place can have. To feel safe and to be safe. It's something that was threatened when Benjamin Casillas Rocha waved his airsoft gun in front of the downtown Denver Islamic Center Friday afternoon. Because the value of that safety and peace was disturbed by what happened. But the center's imam, Mohammed Kolila, says it was not taken from them. This mission that we put for this place, that everyone can come and feel welcomed and safe in that place, is still there and we're going to be stronger with this. He says this provides a bigger opportunity for Muslims. To show people the true message of what Islam is and who Muslims are. Forgiving. I'll forgive him for anything. And welcoming people. Everyone needs to feel safe in their places of worship and that will not happen without the support of the bigger community. For next, I'm Sonia Gutierrez. The Imam says the mosque will remain open to all who wish to enter. They're even planning an open house for next Saturday. Let's hope they get a tremendous turnout there. Strasburg's Fire Board apparently does not want to be Colorado's test case on whether public boards can ban the public from recording meetings. So they banned recording to silence a critic. We told you that. But when R.C. Staker showed up there last night with a camera, they let him roll. They did say that Steve needed to stand in the kitchen next to the boardroom. The board president told Steve in the kitchen that they will formalize their new policy next week. It's pretty basic. You turn on your tap, you want to be able to trust the water you drink. That is not the case for everyone in Colorado. Some of our water supply is privately owned and therefore unregulated. As it turns out, some of that water also contains too much arsenic. But all the health department can do is let the owner know and hope they take care of it. Here's our Anusha Roy. There's a question that's been bugging the Delta County Health Department director. We had no knowledge on the western slope of private drinking water quality. Water, Ken Nordstrom said 36,000 people, or approximately 60% of the population across six counties, rely on. But this water isn't regulated by the state because it's privately owned. So they paired up with CU Boulder to test some of those water wells and found not everything was okay. We're surprised uh, in a way. Professor Joe Ryan helped with this study that found 11% of those wells had too much arsenic. In some cases, twice the state safety standard and it's something that you just wouldn't think about until you have a problem in the short term arsenic can make a person feel nauseous and throw up long term it could be connected to a higher risk of cancer and diabetes depending on how much arsenic a person drinks and their size we have not had any direct links to uh, private drinking water, people getting sick. But Nordstrom also said they don't know for sure because their records are incomplete. This is something that other counties ought to be checking on. Around 10% of Colorado's population relies on private sources of drinking water, and there are roughly 190,000 private water wells, some used, some not. I know exactly what these people are dealing with, you know, drink from private well myself. But not everyone is a professor with access to a lab, so cost of testing can become a barrier. One of the answers we get to that question is, oh, I've been drinking this water for 30 years and I'm, I'm not sick. 
So all they can really do is encourage these well owners to make some of those fixes, test more regularly, follow through with that because they can't actually force them to do anything because the wells never move. They're still on private property. So these owners, that means that they're responsible for paying for the water test that can cost as much as $260 and then filtering out the arsenic, fixing that problem that can cost around a thousand bucks that would be coming out of the owner's pocket. So Nusha, when I picture arsenic, I picture either like a like a, a murder mystery or yeah. industrial waste, but I'm also not that bright. No, well, no, that is why we researched this today, right? So <laughs> what they are telling us is that they think it's natural. It can occur in the rocks and soil that happens, mm -hmm. seeps into the water. And what they were saying is that there hasn't been enough industrial activity, which helped them rule out that this has a human caused problem Sig at this point. Significant bill for the folks who get those mm -hmm. notices. All right. Thank you, Nusha. The dads homebrewed together, their children played together. We now all know one of those kids' names. Kendrick was amazingly warm and friendly. They have turned their hobby into a tribute to Kendrick, the young man who gave his life protecting his friends. And Colorado's flag, it has not always been a stunner. We'll show you the version history forgot next. Oh, did you see the sunset this evening? It was spectacular with all the clouds that we saw earlier this afternoon. Despite all that, 67 out of DIA, extremely mild and well above our average, not quite record setting. We had this huge dome of high pressure across the state. That's been helping to warm us up the past couple of days, but a storm system out of the Pacific Northwest that just brushes by tomorrow afternoon into the evening, perhaps a quick wintry mix, and then early next week, high pressure is back, so we have another warm up on the way. Tonight with the cloud cover, 
We should only fall to the upper 30s. We'll stay in the 30s across the northeastern plains, 20s up in the mountains. Tomorrow still should be fairly mild in the morning for nine cares. Colorado shares we will touch 60 degrees and then by the afternoon our next storm system arrives. Little rain and a little snow, but before it arrives, it looks beautiful out there. Extremely mild in eastern Colorado and you'll notice the future cast showcasing the clouds early on. A little bit of light rainfall around 5, 6 o'clock. Snowfall coming through the high country and really not a ton about an inch or two tops up in the mountains and no real accumulation here in the city. So a mild weekend, windy and sunny on Sunday. We jump to 70 degrees on Tuesday and then by the end of next week. All right, we cool off. Kyle will bring in a little bit of snowfall, but 70 in November, November, not bad. Yes, ma'am. I'll take it. Thank you, Danielle. Mm -hmm. Tonight, glasses are going to raise at a brewery in Denver. A toast in tribute to a young man wasn't yet old enough to drink on the day that he rushed to protect his classmates from a shooter. Kendrick Castillo was killed that day in May at Stem Highlands Ranch. His father happens to be a friend of the owner of Strange Craft Brewery. They had homebrewed together over the years and this year decided that they would come up with a way to remember Kendrick. We are celebrating the life of an amazing young man, Kendrick Castillo. I knew Kendrick way, way back when his father and I and a bunch of our friends used to homebrew together. The gang got together in May for the funeral and we talked a little bit then about, you know, what could we do to show, uh, show our love for John and uh, do something special for him. We thought about it at that time, hey, you know, maybe we could brew a beer at Strange in honor of Kendrick and try and make something positive out of such a horrible, uh, horrible event. We made this beer bittersweet. Every time we brew this beer, there's going to be some joy and there's going to be some sadness. Let's try and recreate those feelings. Let's make a beer that has some bitterness to it, but has some sweetness as well. That's what's important to us for this brew is sharing, uh, sharing those feelings with the public in the form of a beer. John Castillo helped to brew Kendrick's Ale, helped design the label. Some proceeds are going to go to Kendrick's Robotics Club at his school he so loved. Another version of the beer will be brewed in April to be tapped on May 7th, one year after the shooting.
Colorado hasn't always had the best state flag in America. Sorry, South Carolina. But women fixed that little problem 109 years ago this week. Where the snow is I think a lot of people, if you ask them, when do you think this flag was created, would guess a lot more recent date. It dates back to 1910. November 14th is the day that a Daughters of the American Revolution meeting was held here in Denver. And at that meeting, the ladies were talking about the Colorado flag, or uh, what they thought was the lack thereof. There was a Colorado flag. It was the state seal on a sort of pastel blue background. It wasn't well known. These ladies didn't know in the same way that a lot of us probably don't know there's a state song. Uh, there is, it's called Where the Columbines Grow. Response to the notes of the dove. The women present at this meeting thought there's not a state flag and there really ought to be. Let's spearhead the effort to create the Colorado state flag. So the flag has a ton of symbolism in it. The C, we all know, stands for Colorado, and it also stands for Columbine, uh, because, you know, it's a state song. They love Columbines. We all love Columbines. The blue signifies our blue skies. The red signifies the red earth. And then my favorite of these significations, uh, they really liked Columbines. So they wrote into the law that together, the blue and the red make purple. And purple is the color of Columbines. Have you heard that song before? That's pretty cool. Hey, fun fact, Neil Armstrong took a Colorado State flag on Apollo 11 in 1969. That very flag is on display at the History Colorado Center. So I extended a personal offer right here last Friday, had no idea the response would be videotaped, and that is the good news we'll share with you next. A good news first. Last week, a family asked for a reservation 
for the future. Four-year-old Cannon Wood has lymphoblastic leukemia. He should be cancer-free in April of 2021. His dad wrote in asking us to make sure that Good News Fridays continued until that month. Last week, I invited Cannon on air to come in and share his good news in person in 2021. His parents were recording his reaction. What? I get to go to Nine News? What? I don't... No way! I did, I did. <laughs> Kid's going to come in. He's going to bring his moves with him. Uh, Via Rica writes in tonight, says, Kyle, where do you find all of these ugly jackets? Well, it's funny you ask. This is actually one of my favorites. This was a thrift store find, uh, $3.99. Sam Stark and Son, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Anybody remember them from about 50 years ago?